As we start this session, our primary objectives for the discussion today is to really discuss and understand why real-world data and real-world evidence are important, and reflecting on the changing regulatory landscape um, that we are all experiencing. We also want to talk a little bit about the challenges of translating this real-world data and evidence into real practice. Um, and then lastly, we will talk about how providers and pharma uh, can bridge the gaps and the challenges can be addressed with real-world data to inform and enable better trial and better care. So we'll start with um, Jessica. Um, our first question is, uh, why should we shift towards an extensive use of real-world data and real-world evidence? And how do you think FDA recognition has and will play a role in that? Uh, so coming from a pharma background, we have been waiting for the FDA to do what they're doing right now for a very long time. This is an incredibly exciting time to be in drug development. Um, we've always wanted to be able to use real-world data to get additional indication expansions for medicine. So if we have a drug brought out for cancer A and doctors are already using it for cancer B, well, why can't we use that data to get the indication for cancer B? Uh, and now we can, and, and so it's a really exciting time uh, to be in pharma and to be able to start using real-world data um, for everything we've always wanted to, for additional regulatory expansions, for outcomes-based reimbursement, for, for our adaptive studies. Um, it's really changing the way we're, we're developing. Uh, just a curious, how many of you in here are participating in one of the FDA's real-world evidence initiatives, whether it's Duplicate or Nest or uh, any of the programs? Almost a hand. <laughs> Which one are you participating in? Great. So if you're not participating, I, I would uh, encourage you to take a look at the opportunities that are there. So NEST, the National Evaluations for Health System Technologies, um, really cool pilot projects at the FDA. They, keep, they just announced another 12 projects with um, different providers together with innovative research like Paratherapeutics or Apple Watch, plus some tech disruptor companies, plus you know, your J&Js &Js and, and Medtronics and your bigger um, groups. So, uh, you know, then you've got the replicate studies where the FDA is actually paying to do 30 studies with real world data um, to see if, how, how that stacks up against the RCTs. And they've got list after list after list of what the FDA is doing now is, is really opening the doors and not only saying you have the opportunity, but more saying we have the imperative to start using real world data um, to improve, improve drug discovery, improve drug development, improve access. And then of course, after we, you know, that's what the FDA focuses on, um, after that focus on then how do we use that to improve care? And I think on the improved care side, in addition to the FDA, we've all been watching what CMS has been doing, um, especially their initiative around fighting data blocking, which is, is empowering that shift to enable us to use more real world data um, how many of you follow Seema Verma on Twitter? Yes, you can admit it. Um, she, she's been tweeting all week, just on, uh, yesterday, Tuesday, she, she was tweeting again about how this administration is committed to uh, fighting data blocking and to using real world data for, for reimbursement. And of course, this is really exciting for all of us because especially in this room, we know how many billions of taxpayer dollars went into creating Cerner and Epic and all these nice EHR vendors that we now pay a lot of money to. And now we can't get that data out in an interoperable, usable format. And so the, the data blocking, uh, fighting data blocking from our administration is also then feeding all these real world data initiatives that pharma is really excited about. So, so the, that's the long answer. The short answer is because we finally get to. We finally get to use this valuable real-world data. It's finally usable. Um, we finally have the technology to make it meaningful. And we finally have the regulatory go-ahead and mandate to do it. Mm -hmm. um, Dave, coming from the provider side, what role do you think providers can play in this? And what do providers need to do to have a broader participation? Yeah, sure. So, um, I mean, I, I think that 
Um, first of all, like one of the most important things is just getting buy-in from clinicians. Um, everybody is so overburdened on the hospital side of things. And so saying to them, just learn one more thing <laughs> um, is really asking a lot. You know, it's, uh, and so telling clinicians that they can treat their patients better if they just track these simple data points is, it's not, you know, a feasible way of, um, of moving people forward and, and getting things, uh, you know, getting real world data being used out in the thing. So we actually, we need institutions like Mount Sinai <laughs> to actually back their clinicians and, and provide protected time and funding to actually bring on initiatives where uh, clinicians can start to learn to um, learn to use the tools that they're going to be using that will improve quality of care and quality of life for their patients. Um, I'm really fortunate at Mount Sinai that uh, my, my chair did exactly that. He helped me build the Abilities Research Center, which is entirely centered on being a training se a center for the rest of the department to come down and learn about new technology, new initiatives, and how we can use real world data to um, you know, move things forward. And how have you seen real world data play a role in informing patient-centered care? in your practice? Yeah, so I mean, we, we, uh, we have around uh, 30 active clinical trials coming out of our space right now, and we, we see a lot, and then we have a clinic that is running an active clinical program, so we see a lot of patients, and we see uh, a lot of different, um, uh, a, a lot of different things. I think one really great example of um, real world data at work is, is the TIPS program, so this is what's up here on uh, the results of, of one of our data sets that we froze. So we recently published this uh, particular um, data in, um, in a journal uh, earlier this year. And basically the TIPS program was the simplest thing in the world. It was, uh, we, we got together a whole bunch of older adults who were living in poverty, who were managing more than one chronic condition. And we said, we already know where you guys hang out day to day, public, public libraries, churches, YMCA rec rooms. We're just gonna set up um, young college kids with blood pressure cuffs and things like that and just get your readings done. That's, that's all we ask. And so um, what, what you're seeing here is a data set that we froze which had about 700 participants who had been enrolled in the program for a median of uh, a year. Um, across that time, all we had asked was that they show up to the center to get their metrics read once per week. Uh, we managed to get 78.5% compliance on that one ask. And simplest thing in the world, if their numbers looked a little bit off, mm -hmm. an alert was sent to a telehealth nurse, and the telehealth nurse would call them up and say, your numbers are looking a little bit off, I'm a little bit worried, um, can I call your primary care practitioner and make an appointment for you? Um, the, the, the system cost us uh, $55,000 per year to set up and maintain, um, and we would manage 100 uh, older adults per site. Uh, and what we showed in this, this data set was that we reduced um, ER visits by 60% and under 30 day readmissions by 75% in the cohort that we were studying. So a really, really big effect for not that much money and a really, really simple intervention, but a, a powerful usage of real world data. That's impressive set of work. Thank you for sharing, David. Um, Elia, you have been on the research side and primarily on precision medicine side. How do, how do you see adoption of real-world data in patient care? Yeah, so, <clears throat> so I think um, the way we think about it, you know, both in my past experience and now here at Health Catalyst, it's really, uh, you know, if I take your example, David, you're running a clinic and you're running a lot of trials. And those two worlds have been living side by side very often in siluses. We've heard a lot about siluses today. Um, and, and really where the, those two worlds start coming together, as we had done at Dana-Farber uh, with some of the programs we ran there, that's where the magic happens, right? It's where you bring some of the, so I call it sort of one is the sexy real world data and one is the boring real world data, right? So one is gets you into nature papers and science papers about, you know, genomics and imaging and all the future of medicine. The other one is what a lot of the people at has to, which needs, you know, improves quality and outcomes and entire population uh, population health management programs and so on. And, and when these two come together, you can start bringing the cutting edge and operationalizing it. You can start saying, what's my integrated model of care? How do I transition a person you know, from the standard of care to the right trial for that person? Because it will benefit the person and it will benefit us as a health system. And it's not, it's not trivial, we all know it's not trivial, but having real world data 
from both sides and saying, well, I have this, you know, I'm running 70 trials at my, at my uh, organization. How do I figure out which, for example, high risk, high cost patients could we switch to a trial, have the potential to have better outcomes if I understand my population fully? So it's sort of, in my mind, it's bringing the operational data, the research data, and the population health approach into one continuum of care that benefits both the provider and the patient. That's how I think about it. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Um, Jess, can you speak a little bit about what kind of participation have you seen from the providers in using real-world data in the clinical trial space? Yeah. So usually, um, <laughs> pharma has wanted to have access to this data for a very long time. Uh, and they've had to be content to just buy data from different sources. Um, and so now, largely through work with companies like Health Catalyst, they're able to access that data in, in almost near real time as well. And that's changing the way we're designing studies and, and doing research. Mm -hmm. um, and also exciting for everyone else in this room who wants faster, better, cheaper care. Uh, it's gonna probably reduce costs as well because we'll finally have uh, the ability to do that outcomes-based payment in the U.S. that we've already been negotiating for a long time with the HTAs in you know the U.K. or Germany or France. Um, so it's I think the a lot of providers probably haven't had experience working directly with pharma doing this, and maybe <laughs> maybe that's not the easiest experience uh, working with with pharma directly is can be quite complex. So I, I do think it's good to have a, 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 a strong middle player um, that, that can develop this field and, and actually catalyze some faster movement. Um, but if providers are willing to share their real world data, um, there is a, a big market of pharma that is willing to, to pay for it and access it. Uh, we're, we're just at the very beginning of this curve, though. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's a switch from going from the old CROs where we would go to Parkcell and IQVIA and say, okay, what do you have for me here, um, to having more of a collaboration in a, in a relationship. Mm -hmm. Just want to add something to that, because I think at Health Catalyst, we're really trying to shift the paradigm in the space. So the last five years have seen um, quite a few companies become this sort of data brokers, data aggregators, data resellers. Um, and our vision as we built out Touchstone and as we built out an aggregated data set across clients um, was first of all to benefit our providers, right? So to build, you know, benchmarking, to build collaboratives, to build anything that can enhance their own research and their own outcomes. But also as we build out the life sciences, the first thing we tell pharma is, I'm sorry, we don't sell data, yeah. right? We're here to work with you. You have a new interesting therapy that's coming to market. You want to understand what's the best patient selection algorithm or you want to deploy some new national guidelines you know, for a disease, we're here and we're listening. But if it's about you know, shipping you some data and getting paid for some data, that's not our, our business. And I think it's been very interesting because some of the, in the meantime, pharma has entire departments dedicated to real world data. And some of the real world data departments are like, why? Like everybody else is selling us data, why don't you do it? But then as we engaged more the chief medical officers, the medical affairs organizations, and the leadership of these companies, uh, there was a very strong willingness and actually enthusiasm about the fact that we're trying to pave this way because of that neutrality, because of the outcome focus, because of being able to create a, a, a third-party place where you know a risk-based contract can be negotiated and so on. Great. Thank you, Elia. So we have talked a little bit about the use cases so far in this discussion. We've talked about the value-based contracts. Can you talk a little bit more about pre-market versus post-market use cases? And Elia, maybe we'll start with you. Um, on what do you see from the clinical trial space where real-world data can be used, and also then post-drug launch, post-device launch, what can be done in the standard of care practice? Sure, yes, yeah, so I think, and we have, I think, a slide mm -hmm. uh, coming up as well. Um, I mean, generally speaking, real-world data has impact on you know, a, a variety of, uh, you know, of areas, all the way from the very early development um, and, and all the way to when a product hits the market. Um, I think, you know, in the clinical development space, we're ready for a massive revolution. Um, and actually, we're thinking very carefully about what's the right way to shape that, because we keep hearing from pharma how disappointed they are by the mm -hmm. current standard and the current situation. Um, you know, what we certainly would like to see for patients 
um, is that if you think about it, a patient nowadays, so it's gone from basically a couple of zeros like IQV and so on to that plus a lot of digital tools, but still a patient basically almost randomly based on whether they downloaded an app, whether they live in a certain region, whether a hospital has a certain relationship, end up being proposed to be enrolled in a trial. There is no place in the world they can go to and say, well, there happen to be, like in NASH, 42 trials, 42 trials going on right now. Which one is the right for me, based on my biomarkers, my age, my you know, clinical setup? Uh, which one has you know, higher probabilities trans transparently, which is likely to actually have higher efficacy just based on current understanding and knowledge of the disease? All those things are not available, right? So if they're lucky, they find out about a trial, but there is no way for them to um, to really find the, the right one. And I think, so that's, that's one that is hard to crack, but I think is absolutely fundamental, creating transparency and collaborative approaches around trials so that we get the right patients on the right trial. Um, a lot of the trial problems have also been that a lot of companies were created in the last few years relying on real-world data for bas very basic exclusion-inclusion criteria. So, you know, give me, find me all the diabetics that are above this age and with this, you know, lab uh, results. And then maybe like 3% of them actually enroll in a trial for a lot of, again, operational real world data, right? Like are they, do they still exist as a patient? Are they coming up for an appointment? Can I actually switch them? You know, all of those things. Um, so I think that part, that entire part of clinical development needs to be completely redesigned. We probably can't do it alone at Health Catalyst. We have to find the right partners, to, you know, the right thought partners and the right technology partners. Um, and then you move along, and as something starts becoming successful, you have a lot of other considerations like health economic outcome research. You know, we, um, we have here attending uh, people from MedRhythms. We've signed a collaboration. A lot of it is like, oh, I have a great digital therapeutic, and I know clinically I'm doing the right thing, but how do I actually land in the market, understand, you know, prove my outcomes, prove the pricing, understand what the right pricing approach is, all of the things. Again, with all the providers, we can actually build much better and more transparent and informed decisions around those. And Jess and David, curious to hear, out of all the use cases we have talked about today, which one would you pick for the providers to engage with? Uh, regulators or with pharma companies or med device companies? In? All of them? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a good question. Um, I think it depends on your organization. What is the low-hanging fruit that you can actually implement? Because anything you can start doing now is, is better than, than not. Um, so it, it really depends on, on the data that you have and more than that, the people you have in your organization and what their expertise is and what their willingness is to, to engage. Uh, and, and it's really those individuals in your organization that are going to be the driver of your innovation in, in real-world data. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I. There's so many exciting new companies coming up in this space. Um, so I'm now on the, the investing side of the healthcare world. And, you know, what, Elia, you just described, you know, there are startups that are trying to do that, but only in a specific area. So in a certain type of cancer, there's a group where, you know, they will request all of your records and then find the studies that you're best matched for and then recommend which studies might be the best ones for you and facilitate all the engagement. Um, there are startups that um, will work with big researchers in the FDA and will auto-sync all the data from all the different sources and do the deduplication and um, then share it directly to the researcher. So, you know, th there's a lot of meaningful innovations happening with smaller companies in this space. And um, it, it takes the individual personal relationship from someone in your organization that understands what that new startup is doing in that space and understands how to make it work in your company and how to navigate that change because it's much more about the people and the change management than it is about the technical capabilities. That's the easy part. Um, so you know, finding who in your group is ready to take on something interesting and what is the startup that they have a intellectual passion and curiosity about to help them innovate in what you're doing in real world data. And, and you find that piece and you will attract great researchers. Pharma will come um, and, and they will be a very happy partner. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, probably there, there's, there's, there's so much room for collaboration in the space once you have the real world, <coughs> world data unlocked and you're making it usable, both for research and care. Do you want to add there too? Yeah, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> uh, 
Siddiqua, as you very kindly pointed out when we met uh, yesterday, <clears throat> and we hadn't seen each other for a while. I had hair three years ago. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> coming to Mount Sinai and trying to work in this ecosystem where it's my job to accelerate new technologies into the clinical system um, has been really tough. I was in a moment with uh, my, um, my vice dean, um, Eric Nessler, who's an amazing guy, and you know, I was just sort of just raving at him because I was like, all of this bureaucracy that we need to deal with, and he said, you know, most of my faculty, I just need to shield from one department. Oh. It's the IRB or it's, you know, the fax office or, or the grants and contracts office. He's like, you just have to deal with all of them. <laughs> he goes, you are, you are the most unlucky person <laughs> on the planet at this institution. And <clears throat> it is tough. Most people don't want the job. Most people don't want to do it. Um, and, one, of, you know, so I, I get to see where, like, for an institution like Mount Sinai where, where the low-hanging fruit is and where the really, really <laughs> high-hanging fruit is, <laughs> certainly things that sort of integrate with like um, uh, d clinical trial databases and, and big data sets that the, the university has spent years and years curating, it's so hard to break in there because the university somehow thinks, you know, or the, or the hospital somehow thinks that they've got this gold mine, but they never want to share it with anybody. So it's kind of this hilarious thing that they hoard away and they say, no, that's a non-starter, no one can touch this. But in the meantime, you know, the barrier to entry is so great, even, even though they could do so much good if they let it in. The real opportunity that I see is remote physiologic monitoring. We've got all of these new billing codes for it. We've got so many um, clinicians who have thousands of patients with chronic conditions where the cell is so easy. Learn this technology and now you can bill 100 bucks a month per patient without really changing your practice all that much mm -hmm. and at the same time providing more care. It actually is, you know, win-win, win-win-win for, for everybody. And so um, we've been really pushing that angle and have been doing it successfully. We've had a lot of funding coming in mm -hmm. for just utilizing these brand new billing codes. And the only eyebrows that were raised at Mount Sinai was, believe it or not, and you know, talk a bit out of school here, they said, what are you billing those codes for? They're, they're so new. Should We usually wait like two years before we bill a new code. I was like, are you <laughs> crazy? Like, are you serious? <laughs> Go, we, we've got to move. And um, and thankfully, you know, we, they were good enough to, to let us move. They, the you know, the lawyers did their thing and they were like, okay, we think you probably won't go to prison for this and, and off we went. <laughs> so, yeah. Great. Just wanted to add a comment yeah. <laughs> on what you said about the first part, right? Well, like what for you is high-hanging fruit because of the data hoarding and so on. I mean, that's what I think we have, and I'm speaking also to our, you know, providers here. We have this incredible opportunity because Touchstone now is the default part of DOS. Uh, you know, we have all the data you know, available through the same technology, the same, it's the same data model across multiple providers, you know, for your own use, for third party use, whatever we decide together is appropriate and interesting. And, you know, whenever we talk to pharma, their biggest pain is that it doesn't matter how big and amazing Mount Sinai is, it's still a small part of the US population, right? And so their biggest interest is like, you know, I work with the top AMCs, I work with the top KOLs, and then I get, I have two problems. One is that basically I've done all of my clinical development in the most sort of clinically luxurious AMCs in the country. So I don't actually see the real patient journey of the average US patient for that disease. So there's actually some scientific deep problems in developing a drug all based on a couple of great places that have you know, the best possible path and then deploying that drug in a completely different environment. And then secondly, and we've done a lot of you know, analytics on this, Whenever we look at any cohort that pharma is looking for, all those amazing top AMCs represent maybe six, seven percent of the total population that we have, not even the US population, but the one that we see at Health Catalyst, right? So, so it's interesting that on the one hand, you have this incredibly, still this incredible hoarding behaviors of like, oh, my data is precious. And then the reality is it's a very, very small part of a much bigger and richer picture. And really, the, I see the role of places like Mount Sinai and partners in Stanford and so on as saying, hey, we've nailed like the best possible path to diagnosis, the quickest diagnosis, the best possible path to treatment, the best workflows, because we've been working, let's say, on this rare disease for the past 20 years with the top people in the world. Why don't we take all of that and together with the leading academic medical centers, bring it to the other health systems that 
you know, cannot have that unless it gets digitized and, and there's a clear path to transformation of that pathway. Right? So I think that's the real way in which a top AMC of the world should think about its data, not so much the data and the hoarding and the asset, but the, you know, it reminds me this morning about wisdom versus being smart, right? The wisdom is saying, we know how to handle these patients in the best possible way. Let's distribute that, of course, with the right commercial arrangements and, you know, whatever, uh, you know, revenue shares, et cetera, but let's bring that to the up to the 90% of the population that is not seeing it. Thank you. I think you all highlighted the challenges and the opportunities that we have to overcome these challenges in the real world data and the applications of this data and the real world evidence with it. Um, I'm curious to hear um, how optimistic do you think we should be or cautious we should be as we think about the application of real world data to drive either clinical trial or research or clinical practice because there is a lot of uh, hesitation when it comes to pharma, when it comes to med device companies, when it comes to providers in this space. In fact, what we're seeing is that regulators are way more ahead in their thinking in this administration. Um, so how do you think we should approach this? Um, take a more optimistic lens or take a more cautious lens? <laughs> I, I definitely think we've got to be optimistic. Um, I think the only way to get through this is boundless maybe even naive optimism and just, you know, <laughs> keep going until people let you do what you want to do. Um, uh, there are a lot of challenges that we need to overcome. I mean, <clears throat> we, we, we talked about some challenges. I mean, lots of problems. I mean, sensing in context is one of the biggest problems that I face. You know, we give people these sensors to take home uh, and working on both the high performance end of things and the, the patient centered end of things, I've seen some spectacular failures of technology that range from, you know, um, high performance surfers on a 70 foot wave, you know, completely crapping out all of their equipment because they're on a 70 foot wave, um, <laughs> all the way through to um, older adults throwing their Fitbit up onto a ceiling fan and doing 100,000 <laughs> steps in a day um, <laughs> because they worked it out. They worked out the system. Um, so understanding, you know, <laughs> passive sensing doesn't always work. Understanding yeah. the limitations of your sensor, understanding that you're, you know, there's always going to be, you know, building a better mousetrap sort of idea. People are always going to find ways to cheat what they don't want to share. Um, so finding... I don't think we're ready for unsupervised for award world data just yet. I think we need highly supervised, do this thing now while we're watching, mm -hmm. but at least let's do it remotely mm -hmm. so that, you know, we, we've got a pretty good system. Um, I, I think that we've got to be really diligent with... Um, the world is going to be watching how we use EHR data. Mm -hmm. um, there are incredible biases in EHR data, Certainly. whether we're just talking about the fact that most doctors that we're mining from a white males, and there are implicit biases there that, that have been proven over and over again. Mm -hmm. And so in certain cases, we've got to be really careful how we use it. Mm -hmm. Or just in a future-proofing sense, um, in orthopedics, for instance, we've got the wonderful world of placebo surgeries going on right now, mm -hmm. showing that a lot of orthopedic procedures that are bread and butter that have been done for the last 30, 40 years don't really work. Mm -hmm. and, and so therefore, if you're using if you're mining EHR systems to come up with better clinical pathways that, that have orthopedic surgeries in the mix, sure, that might work in the short term, but it's not going to be future-proof. Mm -hmm. um, and so a mix of optimism and, you know, just, just making sure that you, you deeply understand your subject matter as you're moving forward, I think, will get us there. Mm -hmm. yes. I'd say it doesn't matter if you're an optimist or a pessimist, it's here. I mean... We have enough of the J and J's of this world already engaging in, in real world data studies with the FDA, and you, you know you've got your codas and flat irons going forward with, you know, regulatory e expansions for additional indications. Um, you know, you've, it, it, you're using it to get data for digiceutical approvals. Um, it's already here. So <laughs> the only question is, um, do we want to be a late adopter or do we want to get ahead of the trend? Um, but, but it's here. So regardless of how you feel about it, it's time to, you know, just uh, make sure you have the right people in your team and, and uh, give them that freedom to start doing something in this space with real-world data in research and 
uh, obviously your interest is also in Im using real data to improve care. I'm very much coming from the pharma research side, but um, you know, that's why you're all here, because that's already your bread and butter business. Uh, so it's, I can't wait to see, I, I would hope that we move a little faster than has been historically the incremental trend of evolution in healthcare, <laughs> please God. Um, uh, but we'll see. So, you know, I stick to my relentless, pragmatic optimism. <laughs> um, I mean, I think it's here, but it's here for a richer, whiter, uh, mostly American data points, right? And, uh, and it's not here for uh, a lot of other parts of the states. It's not here, certainly, for most other countries in the world. And uh, when I think of, you know, what we've been discussing today, all the opportunities, trials, I mean, to me, success is that a rare disease is not rare because you're looking at a database that is, you know, worldwide, and where a kid that wouldn't even afford, you know, the most basic care gets on the most advanced, you know, gene therapy for their rare disease, and the pharma is happy because they actually can recruit the number of patients that they look for, and and the, and the child gets a chance to live. So, um, so there is a long, long, long road ahead, and I think tackling those aspects of, you know, whose data with which biases. Uh, what is driving the data collection will be um, absolutely fundamental. Um, but, uh, but the optimism is there because I, mean, I think we've seen this morning, you know, with the, the amazing talk, you know, on criminal justice, that if you break silences and you expose data, you can't cheat, right? You cannot cheat data. Data tells the story. Um, and once it's put in front of people, it starts changing, you know, uh, practice and it starts uh, moving us towards the right direction. I think this was a great order for you guys to sit. We went from let's be a little cautious to this is here and let's be very optimistic about it. Uh, great way to end the discussion today. Uh, we'll end with a poll question and then we'll open up for a Q&A. If you guys can please take out your phones and vote for this question, um, that would be great. And then Steel will give us the answers. <laughs> Shifting. <laughs> Jeez, TV. <laughs> All right, this is great. Um, I think we are seeing some optimism here. Um, that's great. All right, and let's open it up for Q and A. applause, first of all, for great information. Okay, some really good questions. Um, and I'll let you all pick which uh, person would choose to answer. For rare diseases, how many patients' real-world world data is enough? It's a good question. It's a, it's a great question. So. I think when we go into rare diseases, uh, one of the most interesting things we're experiencing um, is that each rare disease obviously is extremely different, right? And so, um, you know, I've worked in the space for a long time and there are rare diseases that are actually sort of families of rare diseases. And so once you get into the details, you find out that you need a ton of patients to really understand it. And there are others that are actually fairly homogeneous. There's a mutation, there's a pretty clear phenotype. And so the numbers, you know, in terms of like statistics and power calculations um, can stay smaller. Um, I would say definitely what I've seen in the past 12 months as we started tackling this area is that you in the room, which means, you know, the providers that are contributing to, to our touchstone data set, we have more patients for rare diseases than anybody else in the world. And we have more data depth and richness than anybody else in the world if we come together. Um, so we've seen for every rare disease we've looked at, we've seen populations that were you know, between five and 10 times larger than the largest consortia that, you know, I personally funded when I was in pharma or the papers that we've been involved in, et cetera. So there's really an incredible uh, potential in, the, in what we have already. Could I just add one quick thing? Sure. In terms of um, making sure that if you are working in rare diseases, you actually 
since we've got a theme of looking outside our own silo, look outside your own silo, you know, um, certain things can be uh, clustered together. So, you know, a really good example was I had two groups that wanted to make two different apps, uh, one for ALS and monitoring decline in ALS of muscle activity, and one in Guillain-Barre syndrome, and wanting to, you know, both rare diseases, both, you know, um, diseases where you get progressive muscle weakness, and then in one case you get uh, progressive recovery of the muscle weakness, um, and both groups just trying to go off and do their own thing and griping about the fact that so few people are ever going to use their app. And I was like, yeah, but, you know, if, if you work together, you can have a much larger population. And, and it was, the, the response was very much, oh, but I don't work in Guillain-Barre. I'm, I'm an ALS researcher. I was like, oh, my God, you know. <laughs> so, understand, again, understanding what you're actually trying to do with your real-world data can open up a lot more doors than just thinking, I'm an ALS researcher, and, and that's it, in rare diseases especially. It's a, it's a great comment. I'll just add that the way we thought about it when I was in pharma, um, is that we start when we were doing indication expansion, yeah. we would just look at it as graphs and clusters and look at phenotypes and ignore the actual diagnostic codes as a starting point, right? And so you can really look at clusters of patients that can benefit from the same measurement, um, just like you do with basket trials in cancer, right? Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Can I ask an old school live question? Yes, yes. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Go ahead. So I'm going, to, I'm going to frame my question by saying that I'm from Canada. So I'm not very much in tune with all the regulatory pressures and so forth that, are, that exist here in the US. The, the title of the session was um, using real world data and part of it was to save clinical trials or to sort of somehow bring it out of its current doldrums. So I'd like you to sort of address the issue of what, or rescue, sorry. So what part of clinical trials in the current era needs rescuing? And number two, how does real world data fill those gaps? I think that's a fundamental question that I think we need to address before we can start to say that real world data, I think we've all assumed, you're, you're, you're speaking to the, the choir here, so, but let, uh, just going back to those fundamental assumptions, I think it's important for us to clarify what we mean by, mm -hmm. by rescuing clinical trials. Why? Yeah. Perfect. All right, who came up with the title of the, the <laughs> panel? Sadika, do you want to talk about why we need rescuing? Sure. <laughs> Please, go ahead. Um, I think from, being a provider and having participated in several clinical trials um, in different academic medical center settings, the part that we think is most challenging is making these cl clinical trials data informed. Especially when you look at recruitment, right? When you look at what is the right sample size based on my inclusion and exclusion criteria, EHRs have enabled us to apply some of that inclusion cri exclusion criteria in much more detail than we have in the past, right? But many of us are not doing that. Most of us are do using simple tools that we used to use with our CRCs to get those cohorts in as we think about designing the trial. I think if we can fundamentally start changing the trial design process and take a more data-informed approach, given that we have invested so much in these clinical systems, that may be one place to start because now the data is there to inform it. And it may also give us the opportunity to see what are the gaps in data. None of the data sets we have is gonna be perfect, but at least if we start the process, we can address those gaps. So I'll stop there and, yeah, and let I'll others add. add. That, that's a really great point. And I will add in that maybe it's not necessary to save clinical trials because I'm sure pharma is happy to do the same old thing they've been doing for a very long time with the same old people and continue on the status quo if you let them. Um, what is motivating them here is that, uh, come on, this is real world data, it's faster, better, cheaper, man. Um, I can get a live stream of real world data that um, is going to replace the case report forms that I have to wait to get from, for a very long time from my CRO and I can step in. So, you know, there's cases now using real world data where uh, device manufacturers see something in almost real time in the data and, and are able to act before there's an actual problem um, or they're, they're able to adapt their trials. And um, it, it's just so much more efficient uh, that you can do more, right? Because otherwise, we go back to our clinical development committees and we look at like the 10 year development cycles for these drugs and all right, what are we gonna move here? Okay, let's move this indication out a few years and let's move this one here. And, and you know, it's this crazy um, organization game of when do we have the resources and how are we going to move forward? And, and for pharma, it's, 
it's this long lead time. So before we bring a drug out, uh, even for a new indication, there's about two years of work in the market access side of finding the top key opinion leader physicians for that indication in every country around the world, bringing them together, explaining the data, getting to know them, spending time with the professional associations and the advocacy organizations and the governments. And this is very resource intensive. <laughs> um, if you can skip that step because you've got real world data that say, look, it works in this area, and the regulator says, fine, we'll give it to you. That's great for patients, uh, but it's also great for pharma. Yeah, and just to build off of that, <clears throat> in terms of, like, I can't believe that, that anything gets, gets approved in the, in the current way that we run clinical trials. It's outrageous. It's actually outrageous. Like, it's, it's 40 years old, it's archaic, it's like, mm -hmm. start here, we'll randomize you, take this, yeah, it's corrupt. Th take this drug for a while, then we'll look at you at a midpoint, we'll look at you at an endpoint, we'll look at you at a six week follow up, and we're gonna use 100 year old scales that are mainly subjective and averages, um, and, averages and we can f handle the data however we want. That's expensive. Um, it really gives you this binary, did it work or did it not work, with very little nuance of maybe it worked in this cluster of people, maybe we were seeing trending because we have now longitudinal data and we have you know, multiple points over, over a longitudinal period. Um, so the ability to integrate real world data into trials of this nature, especially with the rise of digital therapeutics where we've got companies like MedRhythms, shout out to MedRhythms, who don't have $100 million to spend on, on an all or nothing clinical trial, which, you know, if it doesn't work out, they'll just move on to the next molecule. Um, it really, it, it does save clinical trials because it opens the world up to all of these things that we've been ignoring for so long of patients saying, you know, well, this, you know, when I clap, you know, clip this thing to my, my leg, I walk better. We can now investigate that much easier and much more cheaply with all of these new technological tools. I love what you said about not putting all your eggs in one basket. You know, right now that's what pharma does. We, we pick an indication that we think has the best chance and we invest so much time and money in that. And real world, this real world data approach enables us to actually look at a bunch of areas and, and it keeps us from putting all our eggs in one basket. And that's good for everybody. Um, and we've never been able to do that before so we're all like kids in a candy store. What can we do? Uh, it's very exciting and, and hopefully you all are gonna partner with us in that. Let's go on to the next question. Um, privacy of data is a huge issue in our society. Do you think that the general public would have concerns regarding their data being shared from their providers when they do not completely understand how it is protected? What is our role in educating our patients so that they understand how it can be used to improve health practices and that we are protecting their confidentiality and privacy? So I, think this is a really I love good this question. question. Me yeah, too. It's a great question. <laughs> so Rock, we, paper, scissors for <laughs> No, I think it's good actually to bring both perspectives. So I'll just answer it from the health catalyst, touchstone, you know, like the data that we, we handle for you and on your behalf. Um, that's been sort of at the forefront of everything that we think about as we approach this, um, this entire area. And it's actually was one, one of the main reasons why we decided we're not data resellers and data licensors. And interestingly, that's against what some of our providers already do, right? Like some of our providers clearly license, sell, package, you know, their data, but we just decided that our position is not to package and sell and ship data, which already removes one layer of, you know, of, uh, of issues because at least everything that happens on our cloud, we can decide what happens. We have logs, we can trace it, we can understand what's being done to it, we can find breaches. Once it's shipped, you know, like um, a large, large, large global tech company, I was told, um, you know, made a deal in the Philippines for a very you know, social good impact project that collected data about its citizens, except the government decided you know, a little bit later to reuse it for completely different purposes for you know, the famous drug trafficking um, sort of uh, fight that Duterte is fighting in that country. So once it's out of your control, yeah, you can sue them, you can take it back, you can cancel the contract, but the damage is already done. Right? So first of all, from our perspective, you know, we adhere to the highest standards, like we're CFR 121 compliant, et cetera, et cetera. And at least we say, because we're not shipping data out, we know what's being done to it, and we can agree together what are permissible uses and how to handle it. So I'll just take the health catalyst kind of side of things. No, actually is very much aligned with what I was gonna say. Um, you wanna partner 
with organizations for data. You don't want to be buying and selling data. Um, but the interesting thing about our health data is it's not a binary ownership. Like, if I own it, it doesn't mean you can't own it. Like, multiple people can own it. What's important is, is how we're um, protecting patients' rights. Uh, but patients, if they're giving you if, if they're giving you the access to the data and they're authorizing it, you know, HIPAA doesn't apply because once they have the data, they can do what they want with it. And, and what we're seeing is if you explain that really well, even in non-English speaking populations, so you know, in Spanish or in different languages, when people are aware of how their data is being used and they do feel the control that they have and, and the autonomy over their own data, they're very willing to use it in research. And that goes up even more when you give them feedback on the research that they were part of. So here's the research we did with your data. Thank you for your contribution. Here's the impact it's having. Here's where we're going to publish on it. Um, and, and then it goes up. And you would think that non-English speaking populations or lower income populations would be um, more hesitant to engage in research because traditionally that's been the case. But when, when you work with them in an empowering way so they do have that autonomy to give that true approval over how their data is used, their willingness to engage in research goes way up. And that's very exciting for all of us who actually want to partner with people to do studies instead of just having a CRO enroll subject X in a study. Um, that enables these longitudinal long-term relationships that have never been before been possible with a pharma company. So it's, it's very exciting. I think the other comment I'll add to this is even when we talk to our pharma partners at this point in time, they're having a tough time with CROs to meet the minimum eligible cohort criteria for clinical trials because CROs are not taking a data-driven approach, right? So that data is out there. You have the consent from your patients. Can you use it to take a more data-informed approach towards these patients' recruitment? And then the second thing we, that was brought up was um, all of the rare diseases. All of these rare disease patients are looking for the communities and looking for the right trials. If we don't use the data responsibly and get them to the right trial or get them to the right provider, what's the use of that data? Can I, yeah, go ahead. I, I loved what Jess was saying and I want to zoom in even more on that because I think that where we need to get to is treating our patients with authenticity and respect and actually getting to know the community you're trying to impact, making friends with members of that community, treating patients like partners. And I want to see it get to a place where we monetize data for patients. Mm -hmm. Share this. You get two bucks a month for sharing your diabetes data. Mm -hmm. Like, let's do that. that. That's a really good idea, and it's a really good way of incentivizing patients to actually be willing to share their data um, so long as there's a level of trust and a level of, you know, understanding that what you're doing is better. So just want to very briefly touch on two points. One is I would encourage everybody to read up about Laura Savage and her Senate hearing and how she very clearly states in her position paper that data cannot be sold, right? Patient data cannot be sold. We can sell insights, we can sell outcome improvements, and that's why we want to sort of lead that wave and start educating others that you don't sell data because your glucose levels are your glucose levels. Building outcomes on that is what, you know, what can be sold. And to the comment on rare disease communities, working with a lot of them, the first thing they would tell us is, I'm walking with my disease on my face. Don't talk to me about privacy, right? I just want solutions for my, you know, my kids. I want solutions for my husband. I want solutions for my wife, right? So absolutely, if they're engaged and if they feel that what we're doing is meaningful, that's going to cut across all the red tapes of the world. One, time for one more question, okay. and there are so many good ones, but I would like each of you to respond to this, just a, a quick comment, how a piece of real-world advice to get organizations to share their data. What, what would you tell an organization, a bullet point that you tell an organization, yeah. encouraging them to share their data? And David, you actually kind of just touched on that, but I'm sure you have other thoughts. Um. I mean, I, ugh, my real world advice is um, <laughs> no one's going to do it other than you, so go out and do it. Like, um, it became really apparent to me with all the projects I was trying to run at Mount Sinai that all of the people who are sat in bureaucratic positions with the titles where they're supposed to be doing this job, 
their job is not to do their job, that job. Their job is to do the opposite of what their title says. So their job is to block everything that comes to their desk. So as if you are actually truly passionate about getting your institution to share data, find a project that you love um, and just barrel through everything to get it done. And, and then you know watch all the accolades come in because once you actually get the thing done, everyone goes, oh my God, that's amazing. No one's ever done that before and it's like, yeah, because no one actually, you know, had the, you know, before stroking out, you know, had the resilience of blood pressure to make it all the way through <laughs> um, all of the barriers. But uh, I'm just going to say go out and do it for sure. Excellent. Okay, Jessica, you have a some real I, world. Go out there. and do it. Too. I mean, just just do it. Um, find, find a project, uh, find a team member in your organization and, mm -hmm. and do something innovative in this space. There's, there's so much to be done. Uh, if you can find a way to please use it to empower individuals while you're doing it. Uh, you get extra brownie points because th there's, there's so many good ways to do that now, it's almost silly not to, uh, or, or unethical not to. Um, and um, I'd say be very public about it. And that may be a weird piece of, of guidance, but the more you speak publicly about it, the, the more you're creating the environment change. The more what you talk about is gonna be picked up by the consultants who are advising pharma and picked up by the analysts. And you are going to generate the self-fulfilling prophecy. So it, some, I know we all like to frown on those few companies that we all know in the US that make a huge announcement and splash when they're going to do something, not when they've actually done it. And usually I complain about them and say they should wait till they've actually done it before they do a big press release and get all the, you know, get the rise in their stock prices. Um, but in this case, go ahead and please, please be public about it. Make a stand. We are going to do this. And we don't know yet how it's going to play out or what the impact's going to be, but we are committed to doing it. And that is enough in this space to, to move the barometer. That is enough in this space to push uh, to, to get that, yeah, to shame people, to get them to jump on the bandwagon, whatever you want to call it. But please don't do this in a secret, quiet working group somewhere. Just go ahead and put out a press release and be public about it and talk about it all the time. Um, even though it's an experiment, talk about it very publicly. So I, I, would, I would take a uh, different perspective. You know, think of somebody very dear to you that is suffering and question yourself if you have to Google for hours before you have the right next step for that person. If it's easier for you to download an app from a startup, then use your own health system. If it's easier for you to find information you know, in a very convoluted way rather than in your own giant, incredible data sets, that's what we have to change. I think from my perspective, um, you have to do it. I don't think there's a choice anymore. Um, I think the environment is changing. Um, I think pick the right project, pick the right cheerleader in your organization, the right champion. Um, pick the right technology partner that enables you to share data and talk to your patients. I think talk to your patients. When you talk to your patients, they will be giving you permission to share the data for the right purpose for the right project. We all do it for clinical trial enrollment. We all do it before surgery. We all do it when we go for a provider office visit. So ask your patient, and I think they should be able to give you the consent that you need to move forward with data sharing. Thank you. This was great. We appreciate all of your participation, and they'll be here to answer questions for a couple of minutes. We have a session starting, a general session starting again in a few minutes, but please come up and, and ask questions if you have any. Let's give everyone a round of applause.